Hello and welcome to Who's Dropping at the Movies. I'm Mike. And I'm Jose. Right, so Cold Pursuit. This is a film which... It's a revenge film. Yes. That's his thing. Liam Neeson, the star. Um, and it's you know slightly in the mould of Taken and things like that. It's, um, it's not a guy getting his family back. He uh, loses a family member early on and it's revenge for that. It's more of a John Wick... Uh, in that respect, kind of, he loses his dog and he goes up the chain of the people in- r- responsible. And spoilers are going to be coming up. We're going to spoil the whole thing in detail, so make sure you see it because it is good. From the first, like, four shots of this film, I really stood up to attention. Actually, I thought, you know, this is like a real filmmaker working here. Every shot was interesting. Yeah. Uh, every composition was interesting. It was beautifully lit. And then, as the story unfolded, I thought. Uh, oh my god, this is like one of those Bud Boddicker uh, uh, westerns with Randolph Scott, right? Which are really sparse and lean and they're like, re- you know, revenge fantasies that take place kind of in the plains or the deserts or the canyons, yeah? But here it's taking place in the mountains and the snow. That was my kind of my first impression. And then it began to be funny and I thought, oh my god, it has elements of like Fargo, mm. right? You know, and then kind of you know, the humor became kind of more playful and visual. And the whole film is basically structured as a revenge fantasy in which Liam Neeson's son is uh, murdered by mistake. Yeah, they go get somebody else and they end up kind of killing him uh, uh, in, a, in a drug revenge thing. Uh, somebody who hadn't paid their dealer. Uh, so um, Liam Neeson finds about this and, you know... Uh, goes to get revenge, so he finds the first person, and then he finds the next one, and you know until he goes out to the to the ringleader of the piece, and then of course a gang gets involved, a gang of native people dealing in the reservation and small towns around it. Yeah, it's set in Colorado. It's set in Colorado, which Mid-end. is very important, um, and you know there's a big splat out at the end, and it's all kind of splat out. Yeah. It's very, very wittily done. Shootout. I meant splat out. Oh, okay. Yeah, you know, so um, it's a shootout in which everybody gets splattered in blood. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, um, and actually, I just thought it was absolutely brilliant. I think it's an awful lot of fun. And, um, I mean, the, uh, Fargo came to mind for me as well. And also Shane Black. Yes. Uh, particularly kind of kiss, kiss, bang, bang. It has that kind that of... That kind of black thing. It has yes. that kind of... Post Tarantino sort of, uh, where Tarantino, I mean, it has elements of like Tarantino as well, um, with like the gangsters sort of t- discussing other things while they're murdering people, that sort of thing. Mm. Um, but it has that that kind of slightly slower pace to it, where you kind of get to sink into absurdities. Um, Except it- you know, every shot is worth looking at. Yeah, I think it's you know an incredible film visually. So it's directed by Hans Petter Moland who is a Norwegian film director, and it's based on a film he made in uh, Norway. Let me just double-check the details. Because um, it says at the end, based on uh, a film by Kim Fuchs Arkesson, but that was, that was his screenwriter, mm. so he's giving him the kind of name drop there. Um, the original film... Give me a second. The original film was from 2014. It's Norwegian. And in English, it's called In Order of Disappearance. I've not seen it. That joke kind of makes its way into the end here as well. The credits come up and say, In Order of Disappearance, because mm. so many people die in this, which is quite good fun. The um, uh, Norwegian title is Craft Idioten, mm. which directly translated means prize idiot. So it gives you kind of a sense of also what's going on here. So he's remade his own film. Mm. Um, and there's, a, well, I suppose in, in a sense, I, mean, I did initially have a problem with... Uh, when Liam Neeson's character first starts killing people, mm. although clearly it then kind of becomes clear that there's a kind of cartoony aspect to mm. this, but it wasn't clear quite at that point. It was still in a drama thriller sort of mode, I think, by this yes. point. And there was an element... He, he plays a guy who just drives a snowplow, and he keeps this kind of stretch of road in between... Kehoe is the name of this little skiing village, skiing a town. Resort. Ski resort, yeah. Between Kehoe and Denver, he keeps his kind of road open. And at the start of the film, you see him being given sort of key to the city, this award for being the best mm. the best uh, uh, citizen of the year. Mm. So he's kind of this stand-up guy. And his son dies, and he 
eventually gets to the point of going, well, this, people did this. Mm. This wasn't. It was. A, it's a heroin overdose, and he goes, "There's no way. There's no way he was a heroin addict." Blah blah blah. Starts killing the people who were responsible. Starts finding them, and you're going. He's so good at this, and he seems to be taken to it so easily that there's going to be a kind of history of violence type twist. That's what I was thinking. Like it's going to turn out that he has some history of this, and at one point he goes to his brother who was involved with gangsters. Yes, and they talk about the old days, but then it turns out there's really none of that. No, so um, that was the problem for me because uh, well, it just I, because he t- he seems to take to it so very easily. No, no, it's basically saying you, this is the guy you know no, from Taken. No, but the film tells you why. The film is clear about why he's so good at it. You know, so he's a hunter, and he talks about you know the relationship with his son all being about hunting. And he's got hunting rifles, and he's got a whole deer in his fridge. Is it different between killing deer and killing people? Uh, yes and no. Yeah, yeah, there is. I mean, no, if you are... I mean, come on, it's a fucking movie. I know If you're established as a hunter, and you're used to hunting animals, you can be imagined as hunting people, which is what he does. I had a problem with it, because I think... It's. I mean, the the fact that he finds killing people like the technique, or whatever. That's one thing, but he doesn't seem to have a problem with it. And I know it's kind of going. Well, he just feels vengeance, but I didn't buy that immediately, really. Well, I um, did. Um, I think it's going. You know, this guy from Taken. You know that this is who Liam Neeson is these days, and it's just just going on that. It's going. Anyway, this is what you expect from Liam Neeson. I I I loved all of that, and the thing is that the film surprises you because you think it's going to be. A very sparse kind of revenge movie, uh, like the other one he did that's set in Alaska, you know, which is like this existential kind of. Oh, the Grey. The Grey. I haven't seen that. Yeah, but yeah. Um, so that's superb. So I thought it was going to kind of be something like that, but visually um, more interesting, mm. because really, I mean, I was dazzled, and there, there are two things. Just you know, the compositions, the way that kind of people are placed next to things and how everything is made interesting. The, the shots of the mountains and people in the mountains and, you know, all of that is rendered beautifully. I was just so struck by that. But also by the intensity of light. Yeah, this is a, a film that is intensely lit. I don't know how to describe it. So the yellows are yellow. It's kind of, you know, the blue is blue. The white is intense and there's many shades of it, right? Like, it's yeah. it's a film that just the colors delight, right? Yeah. Uh, so, and and you begin with that, that it's going to be this kind of Liam Neeson revenge, existential sad thing. And then the tone changes, you know, and it kind of it changes slowly at first, right? And then kind of it gets funnier and funnier. Funnier and funnier and darker uh, and darker. And you'll hear, I'm sure, like when people are talking about this in reviews, you'll hear words like irre- irreverent. Yes. Um, or quirky or, you yeah, know, that exactly. kind of thing. It term. has that kind of thing. Um, um, I, I, but it's actually kind of... I, I mean, I said to you probably 20 minutes in, I said, this is a weird movie because the tone was shifting so yes. heavily. And and it wasn't shifting kind of... Uh, nat- it, wasn't, it wasn't flowing, right? It was kind of jumping back and forth between tones. It was having dramatic moments and more comical moments. And it yes. wasn't kind of t- consistent. Which isn't to say it was bad. I think it's in control of its tone completely. Yes, I think so too. Um, and it's, it's kind of achieving effects that it's going for. Yes. Um, but you do I mean, slightly have to figure out that it's doing that. Um, and actually, I, what you say about the way it looked is great. I mean, you said the, from the moment it began, you said, mm. wow, it's so well lit. Mm. He's kind of, um, he, he's driving a snowplow at night. And so you've got these huge kind of snow drifts that he's plowing through. And the lights on his thing and the lights on the on the uh, sort of barrier that he comes up to. And there's kind of a bit of moonlight. And, I mean, it is incredibly it's beautiful. interestingly yeah. lit. And then the kind of way things kind of flash off his face. And um, and then just just seeing, just the... the, the, the um, the environment that it shows you, it was shot primarily in Alberta. Oh, yes. Um, oh. You see those mountains. And, yeah, 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 and, yeah. And it, they shot it at kind of clearly exactly the right time because it's just absolutely beautiful, the yeah. scenery. It looks like a fucking nightmare to get around. Yes. But incredibly beautiful. beautiful. Um, and and then when you when you come to the kind of the film sense of humour, it has, it has a really throwaway attitude to life. Life is cheap in this yes. world. And it's something that, you know, kind of Liam Neeson's character um, starts to understand quite quickly. And the film communicates that by whenever someone dies, their name comes up on screen. Yes. And, and their nickname, if they had one. A lot of people have these silly nicknames. Yes, and, these gangster nicknames. And then a symbol above, which, which reflects their uh, creed or religion. A film this also reminded me of is Goodfellas. Yeah. You know, so I, I did think it was like a combination of a Bud, 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 
Boddicker, I always mispronounce it. But Boddicker is it? Uh, Randolph Scott film, uh, Fargo, and Goodfellas. Yeah, if I were to describe the mix, that would be the mix. Yeah. You know, Um, because it's got some hilariously dark moments, you know. Yeah. Um, So, um, but I also thought that aside from, you know, this witty structure where, you know, initially it's episodic, so everything is a killing, right? And you move, you realize quickly that, you know, that's how the film is going to be broken up, right? First you kill this person, then you kill that yeah, person. Yeah, you kill one person, that leads into the next person, that yeah. leads into the next person. Yeah. So each one is a killing. Um, so, but I was also surprised and, and really um, pleased by... Um, so on the one hand, the film seems a real boys movie. Yeah, like Laura Dern is in it for about five minutes, right? Their son is killed. She's very sad. She leaves Liam Neeson. You never see her again in the, the rest of the film. Mm. Um, but also, you know, when you think about it, it's like a kind of range of representation that you rarely see in American films of this type, right? So first, there's lots of Native people, right? And there's yeah, lots there's of... A, there's a whole drug cartel, which is uh, Native Americans. Yeah, but it's not just that. There's also... You know, the wife of the Viking, the mm-hmm. head gangster, you know, is also um, a, a Native American person. Yeah. And, you know, the film has a whole commentary on Native American culture. So, you know, the head of the of the Native American gang is walking through this hotel lobby and looks at all these Indian artifacts, right? And, you know, it's made all made in China, right? So yeah. the film has a commentary on that, right? There's the Thai bride. Uh, um, there's the black contract killer you know who ends up in the widest of all places which is like you know <laughs> the rockies and yeah it's yeah. meant to be in colorado um and there's the gay couple who are kind of secretly in love who are working for the the viking yeah they're sort yeah. of enforcers for the viking yeah and, and they're I, secretly carrying on i love that and actually i love that just visually right because one of them is like really short and fat you know and the other one is just kind of you know a normal handsome guy um, so and the pairing is itself in a way funny and endearing, you know. Yeah. There's uh, more ten- that that kiss that they sort of steal in the car when no one's there. Yeah. There's, there's more tenderness in that than in the end of Moonlight. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. And it comes out of nowhere. I mean, it's, and it's a real joy. And then also, because then you have the kind of plot development where um, the the Viking kills off the younger, handsomer one yeah, yeah, yeah. as a kind of offering to the um, Native American gang. Yes. Because they killed one of theirs by mistake, blah blah blah, and uh, and then the way that that affects the other guy, the bold guy, the, mm. the, and he's really the senior kind of enforcer of the Viking. Uh, the way that affects him is affects his behaviour. Like he chooses not to kill Liam Neeson when he has the chance, yes. despite the fact that, he, that he's the guy they're after. Because his his allegiance has kind of been turned by this point. He's the guy who informs the Native Americans that they're going to be here, so come and kill the guy. Yeah, you know, and like that that. So it's not just a kiss that they steal and a kind of thing. It matters for the plot that, yeah. that they were in love. But actually, I think the way, you know, so you were mentioning Tarantino before. But actually, I think the the way that this film is different is, you know, that, well, the humor is progressive and, you know, consistent and um, more low-key in some ways, yeah, more sardonic. But also... There are moments of real tenderness in this film that I don't see in Tarantino's films. No. You know, and you mentioned that that kiss. There was also something about the sadness between Laura Dern and Liam Neeson that was unspoken, but that I also found touching. And then there's the last scene with Liam Neeson and the boy he's kidnapped, right? Yes. Which is incredibly sweet and affecting. Uh, you know, because the, the kid really needs a dad, and his dad, who's the Viking, is not doing that job at all. And, he's awful. Yes. and the kid finds this kind of bit of peace when yes. he's been kidnapped by Liam Neeson, who's yeah. being nice to him. Liam Neeson kind of appreciates that he's got someone to look after. His son's gone. Yes, and look at how that moment is structured because you know he wants to be read to, you know, and so Liam Neeson agrees. But the only thing they've got is like these tractor catalogs or you know these low yeah. yeah this these machine catalogs of for snow removals and and actually so on the one hand the situation is jokey and so on but on the other hand you know they managed to extract kind of real tenderness yeah within something that is both 
frightening. Yeah, the boy is kidnapped, right? Um, and also touching. So there's this this funny, frightening touching, all in the same kind of you know thing, which I thought was uh, was wonderful. Yeah, it seems to be a recurring um, aspect of of kind of roles that Liam Neeson has been choosing. I think the kind of that involve the loss of a family member since his wife died, didn't she? About ten years ago. Yes. Um, t- in a similar setting, I think, because it, it was a, a snowing, um, sorry, a skiing accident, wasn't it? Right, I, I don't know too many details about it, but um, then she passed away about 10 years ago. And, um, and it's something that you see in these roles. I mean, Taken is all about, my family's gone, I'm going to get them back. But also in things like, I, th- I think the commuter had something similar. It yes, kind of the family com- um, aspect. Yeah, well, it's it's become like a Liam Neeson thing. Mm. But actually, I think, and widows too. for my money, this is the... Except Widows is not a Liam Neeson film. No, no, but yeah. still in the role that he's picked, it's kind yeah, of yeah. there's something in there. It's interesting that um, he kind of that this there is a thread that seems to have uh, developed. In sure, his, in, his role. in his choice. Um, so, but I wanted to make a point about Liam Neeson vehicles like Taken and like The Commuter and like The Grey, right? Which are all kind of f- focused on him, as is this one. And in my view, this is really the best of them all except for maybe the gray you know which i think is kind of like a minor masterpiece of a movie really or maybe a you know a masterpiece to court i mean i'll i'll decide when i see it more um you know but that you know this is kind of quite an amazing film i think quite a revelation for me once the kind of various characters and uh, sort of sets of characters get going and the wheels start going um I did find myself going, I'm not sure where this is going now. Early on, it seems clear. Early on, it seems like he's going to go through the set of people he has to to get to the top and there'll be a fight. Mm. Um, and as you say, it, it doesn't develop that way, not entirely. Mm. Not, 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 it's not straightforward, and particularly once the Native American gang gets involved, because the Vikings gang thinks that they're the ones who've been killing his men, so then they attack them, blah, blah, blah. So then it becomes this kind of three-way uh, standoff. And, um, and when he, by the time you get to sort of the various cars arriving at the at Liam Neeson's place of work for the final fight. You go, I don't know who, I, I really can't predict that I mean particularly once you get to a firefight, like you never really, you can't always be sure who's gonna die in this because there's bullets flying everywhere. As it turns out, pretty much everybody does. Well, I was surprised at the ending, actually. I was thinking, you know, kind of how is this film going to end? Right? Because as you said, at the beginning of the film it's like it's purely revenge, right? So his son is dead, right? And he just goes to kill the person responsible. And he does so without remorse, right? And you think, oh my God, this is really harsh and hard. And, you know, the, so so my feeling was there's no way Liam Neeson can get out of this film alive, right? That mm. he's going to have some kind of comeuppance and so on. And actually, I was really surprised at the ending. I think it's a really clever ending. Yeah? Yes. So he lives. Mm. You know, the head of the native gang lives. Uh, they've both lost sons innocently, right, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, kind of um, the, the their, their uh, children have been killed for no reason at all. Like, they weren't guilty of anything. And they're allowed to kind of, you know, leave the movie alive, even though they have themselves caused a lot of killing, though it's always been of gang members, yeah? Yeah. I'm curious. Uh, this is, uh, I guess, just a tangent, but it was. I thought um, Liam Neeson's son was involved in the drug thing. It, no, I, my impression was that he wasn't. That he was work. The guy he was working with what, he was, was a drug himself. addict who owned who owed a dealer. And so, and but they and took they came, the son by mistake. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they um, came to make them pay, right? And um, they took uh, they took the son by mistake. And, in fact, shot him up with uh, heroin and left him in a public place, right? Yeah. That's how he died. The guy who escapes at the start from the van when that kidnapping happens... Yes. Was that the guy who survived? I think That's it was. That's the guy who survived. Because I think, the, I think what the implication is is just they took everybody. They yeah, found. they took everyone who was there. Yeah. But the guy kind of they were after is the guy who was survived who then asks Liam Neeson for money for a fix, basically. Yeah. You know, um, so... Yeah, so they, they weren't discriminating when they took everyone and... Mm. Anyway, um, they took the wrong guy. But uh, but well, but they took the right guy as well. Because he because he got away from the van. 
Yeah. Of anyway, course. they took two people. Maybe they were looking for two people. I mean, that I'm not clear on. Yeah. But I think what what the film makes absolutely clear is, you know, that the son was a mistake. Right. Okay. You know. Um, uh, the 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 son thing is is a thread through the movie, and you notice it. So you know, um, Liam Neeson's son uh, dies. Um, the uh, Native American leader's son. Dies. dies and and you also got this son father son relationship that is really unhealthy and weird between the Viking and his young son. Yes, who uh, who Liam Neeson kidnaps at one point and they kind of treats really nicely in this weird weird scene, weird touching scene. Um, I and there was something about I'd be interested to see what Native American and First Nations audiences. Would make of the representation because you you see you see um, Native Americans represented sh- so little, I'm and it's such, and I think it's great. I mean, once you, once a Native American gang is mm. part of the story, I'm thinking fantastic. Like, this is going to be interesting, and I think it was kind of interesting. But um, there is this kind of uh, difference between how the white gang and how the Native American gang uh, treat their kind of debts, where the the white gang has killed the son. Of the Native American leader by uh, by mistake, thinking he was involved, he wasn't. So they go, well, just co- chop off this guy's head, one of yeah. ours, and send it over, and that'll be paid for. And we want peace. And, and when he receives this gift, the leader says, "That's not good enough. I want a son for a son." Yeah. So, so you know, on the one hand, it's for the white guys, it's transactional, and for the Native Americans, it's a, a blood debt. You know, yes. it's um, it's kind of honorific, and. Um, I can see the difference that they're drawing there, but I wonder how... I mean, obviously, there's a kind of uh, uh, thriller, fantasy, action thing going on in the whole in the movie, but I wonder what Native American audiences would make of that going, oh, they're just treating this as, as kind of weird... Well, listen, I mean, again. I'm sure people will have lots of problems with many of the representations, right? Yeah. You know, so I'm sure kind of this is not like... Uh, you know, an ideal, uh, yeah. repre- you know, representation. I mean, they're all gangsters, really, uh, and they're all drug dealing. So, you know, it's not as if everyone's going to go rah rah how fantastically represented we are. Mm. But, you know, there there are. It's rep- a. It's represented, which you rarely see in films of this kind. It's like Native Americans rarely exist in American cinema outside yeah. of westerns, uh, or outside outside of some problem. You know, so just to have them in an action film like this is great, I yeah, think. I, I um, and the film has a very intelligent perspective on them. So, you know, the film calls out, you know, uh, various characters. No, it's not this. They're not, I forget what they say. They're not Apache. They're some other, you know, tribe, right? And the film has a perspective. I think they're Ute. But, but, uh, but what I did notice is that the film has a perspective on racism against Native people in America mm. that it dramatizes here. Now, you know, how, you know, how well people take to it, I'm not sure. There are other problems, right? So, for example, the the Thai bride who worked in a, who was skimming off the massage parlor and, you know, that, I'm sure people, yes. you know, it's very funny, but I'm sure maybe if you're Thai, that's not so funny, right? So, I mean, one can go on kind of like yeah, that. Yeah, sort of nothing right? but stereotype. Uh, character, so. so, but I think it's still good to, or for me, you know, to have uh, a film in which you see a multiracial America with uh, many cultures, yeah. you know, in which kind of the white culture is just one of them. So I think the film, I, you know, to me, I would praise it for that. You know, though, you know. There yeah, no, I, I agree. Other problems, right. And I think uh, those shots, that you, I mean, it's only a couple of shots where, where the leader is walking through that gift shop, walking through the shop of kind of Native American uh, sort of memorabilia and paraphernalia and what have you. And he, and he sees the rug and then he looks at the label and it says large made in China and he sort of goes, Pff. Mm. and then it has this shot of, um, of, uh, of, of like a bust of um, a Native American yes. head, basically. I don't know if it's supposed to be one of the famous ones or if it's just a just a kind of artifact. And it's got the bust in in the foreground and the leader in the background, and and they they're just next to each other. And you see the kind of the, the resemblances, mm. the kind of you know, there's a kind of um, how do you put it, like a hardness to mm. to his face in a way. That and it just has this thing of this kind of the commodification of his culture in this. Kind of well-to-do, very white um, ski resort in in, mm. in Colorado, and um, and you have that thing. I mean, it, it's it's an old joke 
of um, do you have a reservation? Are you, are you having a laugh? You know, mm. with, where they go to the hotel and they want some rooms. Mm. But then the film like turns it into a whole thing about how they they could. Do you know what I could do to you on Yelp? Yes. Wonderful. And how he kind of um, uses the receptionist's discomfort mm. at possibly having offended someone. It's full of good jokes. It's beautifully structured, or it's very intelligently structured. It's very funny in kind of a quirky way. I mean. Again, you know, the films that come to mind are like, you know, Fargo, Goodfellas, a little bit the films of Lucas Moodison, you know, that have like this blank, offbeat humor. Yeah, you detect elements of that. It's, it is kind of uh, a very funny film, but in ways that are kind of strange and dark, you yeah? uh, uh, so, know? And, and it looks absolutely spectacular. Going back to look, it reminded me as well of the Snowman by yes. Thomas Alfredson, which saw which which you know had its significant problems, but we felt didn't get enough credit for the way it looked, yeah, and the way it was shot in, in the snow, well, and and it obviously shares a kind of Scandinoir, yes. um background to a degree. You know, this is a from Norwegian director, yes. Um, um, I mean, it has it, the kind of the visuals inspire that same kind of awe that we had when we saw the Snowman of just yes. the, the, the the scope. Of this, ridiculous. this has incredibly memorable images, you know, like um, the son of the native gang leader crucified mm. on the highway sign in the middle of the snow and then shot at a kind of angle where the mountains predominate. You know, so on the one hand, you see these mountains, and then half of the frame is just him crucified against the, you know, mm. um, the highway signs. I mean, it's just phenomenal, I think, really. I would have liked more from the villain, who's the, the, the Viking. He's a central villain. I loved him. I um, I would have... I don't think the actor's good enough. Well, I think there were some problems with the actor, though. I think he's very dynamic, though. He's, he's too one-note. He's too hyper and angry all the time. So that's a problem. I, I would um, have liked just a kind of quirk in him, you know? I mean, they, I guess they try and put this quirk in him where he's... Um, He's a sort of peace-loving, vegetarian, look-after-the-earth type. He's of... a soya-eating yeah. or tofu-eating Mr. Right-on, you know, um, the sun yeah. has to be raised in this way and go to this school, and he sets his diet and everything. You know, he's one of those environmentalists who has no problems killing 55 people. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, the, the joke when he dies, because they say when people die, their names come up and you see the symbol over with Christian or... Uh, one of them's Jewish and you know, Sikh or whatever, um, and and the symbol over his name is the CND symbol, which yes. is quite funny. Um, but I get he's he's well, again once the tone of the film began to establish itself as as this darkly comic thing, um, I kind of thought of him really he's a, he's a bit of a cartoon villain, and what I wanted was I would have liked some more interesting. Work. Uh, uh, so something more cartoony I would have liked, as opposed to this thing where it was it was no, I, I, I just a bit thought, annoying. I thought it worked just great, and the main problem is the actor though. And the other thing is that everyone in this film is basically from New York, apart from Liam Neeson, who's from Ireland, like all the Native Americans. Like there's not a, there's not a, a Denver accent among anyone. Well, I mean, I wouldn't recognize a Denver accent, but you know, there there are some people that looked kind of you know mid northwestern. Uh, I mean, I think uh, the cops, and actually one of the things I really loved about the film was the whole supporting cast, mm. actually. Uh, so, um, you know, kind of people, in fact, many of them probably of Swedish or, you know, Norwegian descent or German descent as well, kind of people in those areas. Um, so, I, you know. That's not something I particularly had a problem with. I think that was kind of aiming at the cartooniness, which I would have liked to have seen more from the Vikings. The fact that you know you have one guy who's just so clearly from Boston. In fact, he the, the character was in The Departed, and when he dies, another joke that I liked was normally when someone Christian dies, they just get a simple cross above their name, and when he dies, he gets this really elaborate one because he's a Catholic. Yes, <laughs> you know, um, like it's so clear that he's not from there. But I, th- but I, I didn't have a problem with any of that. I thought that was fun, and that's actually what I would like to have seen more of from the villain, which I felt was lacking. Well, no, I I liked it. Um... And uh, I liked, you know, the way that he's made to seem like right on Mr. Charity, you know, and so on. Um, I think the actor could have been better, uh, for sure. Um, but I, li- I, I, I liked it. And actually, one of the things that I liked about it is, you know, the way that the characters conceptualize. So he's Mr. Right on on everything. 
you know, about what to eat and how to dress and what charity to support and all of those things, what car to drive and so on. And yet, you know, he's someone who never keeps his word. One of the consistent things is he's the head of the gang and he tricks everybody. Yeah, he he kills this one, he cons that one, he tells that one that he's going to pay this but doesn't, right? He he, yeah, he agrees to pay someone 10 grand and then the next thing you see is their name come up because they've just been cross. killed. Exactly. Yeah. So, I, you know, I thought that was a very wittily conceptualized character. Uh, it's true the actor is not maybe the best, but actually I didn't mind at all. Yeah. It was, it was funny that the, the rate at which people died was something that made me uncomfortable for a little while because the film was so um, cavalier about the mm. value of people's lives in this. Um, and again, it was something that took me a third of the movie or more to to get the tone mm. of and get the measure of in a way. I don't know. It's, um, you know, at first I thought... And it's not like it's not like this is the first film I've ever seen that has people die en masse. I mean, more people die in things like John Wick or but, you know, but I don't know that was funny that was just something that, that I had to get into the sort of well the film of. had to win you over because I think it is it is a film that sets up expectations and keeps moving them mm. you know uh, and but it sets up each situation beautifully like you know so for example when you have I forget who the minor supporting character is one of the gangsters you know, when he's telling the joke about the $20 bill to this guy, right? It's like, oh, yeah. you know, Steve Jobs would be so proud of this scam kind of thing. You know, and then the way that they... Re so it's set up in the, you know, halfway through the film. And then at the end, the way that it delivers on that setup, it's great, you know, and it's yes. visually great. Yeah. The yes. Visual, yeah, yeah, <laughs> the bullet goes right through the $20 <laughs> bill. Yeah. So you know where it's hit, right? So... The film does a lot of that, actually. Like, it shows, it shows quite a bit of killing, but also really astute showing a lot of the killing mm. and you just know that people have died because the name comes up or you know or, or you know in that case yes. the name comes up and you see the note and you so like it adds a joke to how he died um it's not a gory film at all no i mean it has elements i mean there is as you say towards the end there's there's a lot of blood going all over the place but actually there's not um, a, i mean a lot of people get killed but actually I, you don't see a lot of blood or gore or well, I don't yeah, know about that. I mean, the first fall. guy he kills, he punches in the face so much that it's absolutely caked in blood. And then he and then he kills the guy. The first in the... one, that's the very first murder in the film, yes. And the second one, he, he shoots and all the blood goes over all the dresses, the bride dresses. That's but, a fantastic shot. I know, but the point is, it's... it. Gory is not the right word, but it is a cartoony sort of gore. Yeah, well, there is a... there is more than a little blood, um, I would say. In, in, in those instances. But, it, but, but it, that's it, also part of the joke. It's making it funny. So, yes, exactly. You know... The guy gets shot, and then all all his blood falls over all these beautiful white wedding dresses, you know. So it's like, like a visual joke that's kind of taking place. So, um, yeah. Mm. Well, I don't know if that was a joke. Yeah, yeah. It was. Of well, course, it was a joke. It's not a joke. The dresses get bloody. It's a visual joke. I don't think so. The joke was was just how cavalierly Liam Neeson shot him. I think. You know, it wasn't that no. blood goes over the dresses, it's just, oh, it's gone. No, no, the joke is also that you got you have all of this kind of splattered on these beautiful wedding dresses that this woman has just bought one of them and there's a whole setup about how beautiful and how great and how go gorgeous and then you blam, splattered with blood. Uh -huh. And actually, it has a similar joke later on when the guy gets shot and he falls on these balloons. You know, if you remember those yes. white folding things, right? And then kind of... You know, there's a splat noise and the balloon kind of dissolves. I mean, those are all great visual jokes. Yeah, no, no, that was a joke, clearly. I'm just saying blood going on the dresses is not a joke. That's just... Well, it might, you might not find it funny. It's a joke. I don't think it's a joke. It's a joke. It's not a joke. What's funny about it? I know I've tried to explain it, but I disagree. That's not a joke. It's just... It's just a splat. The joke no, is... it's a splat gone... on wedding dresses... You There's know, nothing funny about that. It's not a joke. Well, it's not a joke the film, film sets up. Well, I, I laughed, so I thought it was a joke. Yeah, I know, but I don't think that is the joke in that in what's happening there. That's what I'm saying. Well, well why not? Because I said because the film hasn't set no, it up. Just and it because doesn't matter. What, what's a joke? Well, the joke. What's there, a joke to you? No, the joke there. In I'm saying that scene that that killing is a joke, but that's not the joke of it. The what's the joke of it? The joke, as I say, is that Liam Neeson gets his information and shoots him very quickly and cavalierly. That, and it's the, it's the coming out of nowhere and the abruptness of it is the joke. No, the coming out of nowhere and the abruptness is part of the joke. And the guy splattering over the, all of the wedding dresses with, with blood sprayed on them is the joke. Yeah, there's a kind of visual humour in that. But the joke isn't that it's funny that wedding dresses have got bloody. 
Well, I thought that was the joke, and okay. I still think it's the joke. Okay. And actually, I think the film sets it up by having, like, you know, all of the discussion of the wedding and the dress and how gorgeous it is and so on. And then, zoom, it all goes up in smoke. I disagree. Or in blood. I, okay. I disagree on, with that. Well, we could disagree. Yeah. Um, anyway, that aside... <laughs> It's fun, and... <laughs> All right, so would you recommend people to go see this film? Yeah, you should see it. It's good fun. I think it's different, and it's probably not what you're expecting at all. Mm. Um, yeah, it wasn't what I was expecting. It's got all sorts going on. I think it's great. I think it's one of the most original films I've seen so far this year. I really enjoyed it, and I... You know, I just, I think from the, in the first five minutes, I, I, I whispered to you, I'm loving this. Yeah. Like, you know, there was just something so exciting about seeing, you know, just visually, you know, the first five minutes of the film. Yeah. No, that was when I whispered to you, this is a weird movie. And you went, I love it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I, I highly recommend it. Please do go see it. Yeah, no, I agree. It's fun. All right, well, thank you very much for listening. We are eavesdropping at the movies. Uh, we're on iTunes, SoundCloud, and YouTube. On social media, we're on Twitter and Facebook. And uh, the website is eavesdroppingatthemovies.com. Hurrah. Cheerio. Cheerio. <laughs>